Hello, everybody. This is Tony Young. I'm the president and CEO of Rise San Diego. And I want to thank you for being a part of this discussion. Uh, it's going to be really interesting. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, allies, accomplices, and advocates uh, in the Black Lives Matter movement and some of the other uh, protests and issues that have been um, brought about in our, in our community, in our country over the last few months. Very excited to have you. It's going to be an interesting conversation and it's gonna be led by Dr. Roxanne Kaimani, the founder of Kaimani Catalyst Consultants and also a, a RISE faculty member. Uh, Nick, Dr. Nick Franco um, with the Pride Center at Eastern Washington University. She's the director there. Matthew Smith, uh, a former RISE fellow and graduate now. Uh, uh, he's, he runs the youth programs at, um, at Outdoor Outreach. Brisa L. Johnson, uh, who is the Civic Engagement Manager statewide for United Domestic Workers Union. Rachel Martinez, Assistant Director of Student Support Services at the University of San Diego and Dr. Crystal Miller, Director of Le for Leadership and Organizational Development at California State University System here. So we uh, thank you for all of you all for being here. Dr. Kamani, uh, thank you for moderating and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much and welcome everyone to this, you know, thought inducing dialogue. I'm very excited to be here with all of you and our panelists are going to offer some powerful dialogue and I encourage the audience to participate through our chat as well as through the Q&A. So if you have questions that you would like for me to offer to our panelists, please feel free and just continue to have that conversation there. Uh, first, we're going to begin with a poll question just to gauge the audience to get a sense of where you're at in this topic around uh, the differences between ally, advocate, and accomplice. So just take a, a few minutes to read through. And for those of you on Zoom, you'll be able to offer what your thoughts are. And for those of you on Facebook, just get a sense of where, where your heart lies. The poll question in terms of your perceptions of how we navigate authentic social justice terminology, which of the following do you believe are the most important to address? The title of being an ally should not be bestowed upon oneself, but instead, one must be recognized by members of a community group as an ally. Being an ally is not enough. While it is important to voice your support for other communities, whether it be vocally or on social media, it is impossible to make change happen to do that alone. We need to put allyship into action by being an accomplice. We need to focus on advocacy because we should stri all strive to take action politically by lobbying in support of causes. Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities are the experts of their own experiences. It is they that will tell you how you may be most useful rather than you leading, acting upon your own accord. Five, categorizing actions under the labels of ally or accomplice or advocate is an oversimplification. We should all be challenged to always go outside of our comfort zones, take bigger risks and make more significant sacrifices. There is no hierarchy. Ally, accomplice and advocacy work are all crucial and the terms are used as an entry point for those of us having conversations about how to enact social justice from positions of privilege. So take a moment, let us know what your thinking is on there. A little bit more time. 
I know those were some long questions or statements. Okay, let's see what we have. So it looks like the categorizing actions under the labels of ally or accomplice or advocate is an oversimplification. We should all be challenged to always go outside of our comfort zones, take bigger risks. Oh no, I guess it was the other one. There is no hierarchy, okay little complexity, Black Indigenous, it still seems to be growing. Okay, well, let's, why don't we begin with first trying to create some understanding of the differences between ally, accomplice, and advocate. Brisa, would you be able to give your understanding and share, share it with us, please? Absolutely. And so, Hi, everybody. My name is Brisa Johnson. I just want to thank you all so much again for this opportunity. It's such an honor to uh, share space with you all and to um, join the RISE family today. And so my thoughts directly on allyship versus accomplice. I think right now, and, and I've said this before and in other spaces, is activism and social justice is kind of like January at the gym, right? Everybody is getting involved and everybody has a moment in time where the, that fire is set, where they know that they want to do more. And that's what we're experiencing right now. But what happens in that is that fire tends to just burn with no real direction, right? And so what we see is a lot of buzzwords being taken and, and used on social media platforms and in messaging and, you know, and even sometimes on panel discussions, but we're not actually breaking down those words. We're just, we're, we're just saying them because we're used to them, because they're at the forefront of our, of our language and our vernacular. And so I think it's really important to have space to really dissect that. And so I think with allyship is people have taken it and ran with it. And I think allyship is the belief that I understand your oppression and I believe that you deserve equity and you deserve equality. And I believe that black lives matter. And I stand with trans lives and I stand with, with worker rights, right? It's the idea that that my ideologies align with yours. What we're starting to see is that in that thinking and in that belief, it's not necessarily turning into direct action, right? So it's easy to, to say, I stand with, insert the, the fight that is, is near and dear to your heart, um, but not having the skill set and the research and the training and, and the connections to move that to action is really what we're seeing is just the kind of the lack of knowledge, the lack of, 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 um, of access. And so accomplice fills in that void by really moving from a noun to a verb and really putting that belief into action, whether it be through advocacy, whether it be through um, sacrifice, um, putting your own life, your job, uh, your relationships on the line, whatever the case is. And so I think if we look at it from ally being the noun and accomplice being the, the verb, we can really start to create a pipeline to true advocacy and civic engagement. Thank you, thank you. I saw a lot of your the fellow panelists' heads nodding in agreement. Dr. Nick Franco, Nick, what else might you want to add in that conversation around those definitions? I think um, something, Brisa, when you were sharing that came to mind was this idea of performative allyship, right? So it's really easy to post on social media that, that, that I stand with, insert, you know, community that you're, you're trying to ally or, um, align yourself with. Um, and then that's it. You're saying the buzzwords, you're saying those keywords, but then there's nothing, there's no substance behind that. Um, and so really when we're asking ourselves what, when you're asking yourself, what's the difference between an ally um, and an accomplice is, it's not just the self-identifying, right? It, there has to be something else that you're contributing to the movement. And for, dip, and for people, different people, it will look different. For some people, you know, the risk of family relationships, that isn't necessarily the case. But maybe there's some time or money that you can donate to a cause that is advancing the movement, right? So it, you have to figure out, right, what track you want to be on, what are you comfortable with, but in, in 
regardless, accomplice, being an accomplice involves risk. The whole point of being an accomplice is that you are not just supporting the people, right? But you are addressing the systems and structures of power that are disadvantaging, that are creating the inequities around us. And so without that, you're just kind of being a decent human being. And we need more than that right now. Yeah, it reminds me of what Baldwin always says. I can't believe what you say because I see what you do, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Rachel or Matthew, any additional thoughts on the terms, the concepts? I think to build off of what Nick was saying, my understanding of the three words, ally, advocate, accomplice, from one word to the next, it's elevated levels of risk. So similar to what Brisa was saying, being an ally at its very foundational level is just to espouse the belief that whatever group you're an ally for deserves rights. And to take that a step further, being an advocate, then you're taking what you have in your sphere of influence, what's in your power to do, whether it's your immediate family, the community you work within, your job, that you're using that influence to then spread that allyship into those um, spaces. And then third, being an accomplice is, is the most risk, whether you're risking your employment, uh, your relationship with your relationships with your family members, your physical body at protests, that's where we see the most risk in terms of all these three words. Okay, thank you. You know, I notice in a lot of what is getting posted on social media, a lot of blasting of folks who are, you're doing it wrong. Don't post this, not this, or I was told to post this and it's wrong. Uh, Dr. Miller, can you speak to the notion of what it's like in the process of learning systemic racism? How should people go about being a part of the movement, whether it is as an ally, an advocate, or an accomplice? And how do we, how do people get unstuck? How do they get first get caught in that trap of being embarrassed, but how do we get unstuck? Yes, absolutely. And I will just add, um, this is probably one of the number one questions that I get, which is like, I don't want to get it wrong. What do I do to get it right? And off the work of Robin D'Angelo and White Fragility and Brene Brown and Vulnerability, here's the intersection, right? That white culture whether we identify as white or not is pervasive in this country and with that there has been historical rule book of what to do and what not to do and when you hold that up when you ask for certain rights when you try to make progress in equity and inclusion really what has happened is that there has or has not been a response. And that same rule book is held up and said, I thought this is what you wanted and now why aren't you happy? And so we have to make space for the fact that it is complex and it is going to be very messy and it's not about getting it right or wrong. As a matter of fact, if you identify in any of those three spaces, ally, accomplice, advocate, you're acting on behalf of somebody else. It's not your experience. And when we're acting on behalf of somebody else's experience, we're gonna have mistakes. And so I would allow some forgiveness on yourself, but not in action. So it's really important to still act, to still make some mistakes and do it with humility. And when you're not certain, you can ask. And there's always that caveat, right? Of like, well, sometimes I ask and that's a burden too. We don't wanna burden certain groups. We don't wanna tokenize them. And so it's on our own earnest work to do the research, to look, to ask, and know that from moment to moment, it might change. So an action that you could take with one individual in one moment might work for that particular setting. And five minutes later for the same individual, they might be exhausted, they might be done, we are complex human beings. And so for this, I would say like, there isn't necessarily a right and there shouldn't be a right. So if you find yourself going towards that right, that's part of the white majority culture, recognize that this is gonna be messy and step into it. Okay. Nick, as director of, Pride, of a Pride Center at Eastern Washington University, I'd imagine that this is a complex question that you get asked often. How might, what else might you add to Crystal's invitation in this work? 
something actually that happens quite frequently is I will have um, self-identified allies come up and simply tell me how great of an ally they are. And what I can tell is happening is they're wanting to connect with me in some way and show their support. But what actually happens is I'm just hearing like a, like a CV or a resume of all the great ways that they are supporting me. And almost it's as if they want, like I have this magic fairy wand, which I actually do have one, but it's not related to allyship. Um, like I'm gonna wave it over them and I will certify them as allies and they can kind of move on. And so what I would add to what Crystal shared is, I think being really, you know, it's difficult to know, you know, sometimes how to, you know, what to do next. It involves a lot of intention and it also involves a lot of reflection, right? And a lot of reading the, the room and reading the space, right? So I'm never rude to folks who come up and just say, oh, I have a gay cousin and look, you know, let me tell you all the ways that I support that person. That's really great, but I, I also don't need to hear that. <laughs> I don't know who your cousin is. And it also gets tiring, right, to hear that over and over. Like, I, I get why you're wanting to connect with me and maybe you're wanting some affirmation. I'm not the person to get that affirmation from. And the fact that you're needing affirmation in some way communicates to me that maybe this is a little performative and I'm not here to validate that, right? So um, I'm not saying that it's not good to maybe find some inroads of connection, but I think if you're trying to connect with um, a person of a different race from you and you're using like, I have a black friend and let me tell you how I support them, that is probably, I'm not even gonna say probably, that is not the way that you want to go about uh, communicating and even demonstrating allyship. Thank you. Risa. Yeah. So I would just like to add, um, as, as a Black woman, I feel like we're also in a time where we're seeking a more revolutionary and radical approach to things. Because I think for a lot of people, they're just waking up and it's great, right? And we want to have patience and be loving and nurturing to the new woke minds. However, people, especially Black people, have been dying every day from bad policies and bad elected officials. And for someone like me who has grown up in neighborhoods where my first encounter with police was at age 11, for you at 32 to just now be jumping on the train and wanting to do something, it is frustrating because I've been experiencing police violence, systemic racism, microaggressions, from the day I came out the womb, right? And not just within circles of friends and families, but within institutions of education, within healthcare, within my work field, within in elementary school, middle school, college, in church, in choir, in Costco, in Target. So if you are a non-person of color, no, there isn't a right way and, a, and there isn't a right way to do this, but there are hundreds of wrong ways. There are. And I think it's really important for people to educate themselves, to find either circles that are safe space where people are going to be patient with them, where people are willing to kind of nurture them through this, but then also grabbing books from the scholars who have been studying this, who have written um, amazing, amazing work on systemic racism and white fragility and, and white privilege um, talking to organizations who do the work, volunteering with organizations who do the work, meeting with activists on the ground and really listening and hearing not only their stories so that you grow empathy, but then also getting involved in the movement so that you understand the right ways to move and understand the right ways to go about it. Because for many of us, not even those of us who have been in social justice, but again, for folks like me who have been Black their whole lives, are, are, are Black no matter where they go, it, it, this is a, a this is a an experience that has been weighing on us for years and years in our everyday lives, and a lot of us don't have the patience to to teach folks. You know, oh, well that's that's a microaggression, and let me explain to you why. You know, we don't have time. It's either you're on the ride or you're not, because if you're not on the ride, you're just in the way, right? And I think those two ideas that more like. I'm on fire because this has been my lived experience should also be welcomed into the space. And there should be a, 
I may not have liked the way she approached me. I may not have liked that they said I was doing it wrong, but I also need to listen because her experience and the oppression she's have to dealt with every day, I, I cannot understand and I will never understand. So let me sit back, not be so offended and really dive deeper into that education so that I can be better tomorrow. It's, and it sounds like it's a complex, it's, I mean, it really is a complex way of existing and being in this work. Uh, to be a Black woman who is living, who is doing the kind of work that you are, uh, and to try to teach others at the same time that you are also holding on to the frustration. I think there's, there's quite a bit that's going on in relation to this particular movement that there's tons and tons of people who are really trying to learn. And there's a complexity to that, right? As you spoke to it, but then also where can they go then to the learning. There's lots of different authors out there. There's arguments to go to, you know, only research Black Indigenous people of color authors. I know Crystal mentioned Robert D'Angelo and Brene Brown, who have who I've noticed in the past have been cited as key thinkers in this kind of work. But when you talk about the right versus the wrong or or not the good or the bad, how do the people who just kind of feel stuck, what's left for them in that context of wanting to enter into allyship? I open that to the floor. Constant research. I think you, t you touched on it by mentioning some of the great authors and, and individuals who have already been studying this work. Learning, being a life lifelong learner. And I think too, like really plugging in with organizations that do these trainings, that host these panels, that already have the blueprint to how to get involved, blueprints on, on how to, to, to grow your mind frame and your ideologies around these things. And, and not only just here in San Diego, but national platforms as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think a lot of times- I that. Oh, go, go ahead, Matthew. Oh, thank you. Uh, okay. Um, I guess a lot of times I think that, especially white people are like nervous to talk about race or doing it wrong. I know that I've spent a lot of my life being nervous about that as a cis white male, where I didn't address it. And that's being a part of that problem through your silence. You're perpetuating the power that white people hold through that silence. And yeah, maybe you're going to go and you're going to, you're going to make a mistake and there are a hundred ways to do it wrong. But if you don't step in at any given point, that silence is even worse than stepping in and doing it wrong. And you might, you might make a mistake and really truly hurt someone, perpetuate racism and what you're saying. Um, and I hope that you, you learn from that. I, I hope that it doesn't come on the pain of somebody else. And I think that's an important space for white people to step into those conversations that so often in conversations, white people with, with people of color, they flip it on themselves like that, that term like white fragility that you, you said, Risa, where it becomes this conversation about yourself and all oh, the pain that I have or the guilt, but it, it's, it's about stepping into that work and what we can do to stop the system of oppression through um, stepping into using our voice or stepping into doing the, the outward work of supporting through whether it's a donation or your time or your skills to um, continue uh, fighting against racial oppression in this country. And one thing I think of too is that it's not about this moment where you become work. I know that we're like in kind of this, this like race um, to wokeness a lot of times, right? Like, oh, especially right now, I think I, I don't have social media, so I'm not like super in the know on these things. Um, but from what I, I hear and see is like that, that like actorship of posting these photos of, of standing there with people. But what are you doing in that space to continue your awakening? Sure, maybe you woke up at some point, but you need to keep awakening and growing from there. I kind of think of it in my life, like I, I look back 10 years ago on the things that I felt um, or thought and I'm, I'm embarrassed by some of the things that I did. And, and I'm sure 10 years from now, I'll look back and feel the same way. But what can I do to continue that work now to step in um, and follow uh, people of color as leaders to become an accomplice in that action rather than just leading on my own? So I, I guess all that to say is just like the importance of stepping in to speaking out uh, or else you're holding that power through your silence. Crystal? Yes, I was just gonna add, Tony had this beautiful quote up by Dr. Kendi and it was, 
really about the simplicity of either you're a racist or you're anti-racist. And then a little bit further in the chat, I saw a comment about like, and then why are we citing these white authors about this work? And I think when it comes to white virgility, it's so helpful to have the framing from somebody in the experience of getting it wrong. And explicitly, what I think is really helpful is because um, that it's easy, it's easy, I'm gonna say that, it's easy for somebody to want to step into allyship and see themselves as an anti-racist, but anti-racist uh, thought, philosophy, ideology, and being are very complex, even though Dr. Kendi breaks it down in a really simplistic way. And what I think is really powerful about Dr. D'Angelo's work is she challenges us to say, not if you've even asked or said out loud, but if you've even ever thought, I'm not racist, I'm not racist. If you've even ever thought that, you're a dangerous person. And here's why. And I think it's really in your face about it, about saying like, then you're not seeing all the ways in which society has normed you to think and feel a certain way. You haven't done the work of deconstructing. And I think once you understand that, you can go to the foundational text on what deconstruction looks like. But I think there is a push for white culture to really recognize the ways in which they have created, perpetuated the existence of systemic racism. Thank you. It, it just, it feels complicated. And, you know, oftentimes I've, I've had conversations with people who really are wanting to enter into the space of allyship and they even might might call themselves an ally in one of the poll questions up there you know kind of can people even do that can they refer to themselves who do they have to look at or look for in order to be a part of that movement and you know i i take it a step further in the in the notion of can people still be an accomplice if they're trying to figure out allyship A stunning question. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to answer that. Um, I think the answer is yes. I think that um, you know there are people who I've en encountered in my professional life, um, especially as someone who's now like the professional gay on campus. Like I'm paid to be gay and to teach people about gay and trans and queer things. Um, I think that there are people who clearly need more education, but they're they have done things for me and for the Pride Center because they have the institutional power to do so because they know that it needs to be done. They might not know exactly what, why it needs to be done, but, but they know that, yeah, this is, this is the right thing to do. And so I think as people are figuring out allyship, they can also be an accomplice because really to be an, to, to be an accomplice, you need to be following the lead. And so if you're following the lead, I mean, already you're kind of taking this like hum humility standpoint that someone knows their experience better than me and that they're going to tell me exactly what they need. You're listening to that and you're wanting to act or support that effort, even if you don't necessarily know all the intricacies of you know, what, it, what that means and what the, the history of the struggle has been. So I think that you can be both, I think it, you do need to have, be in order to be an accomplice though, in order to take that humble approach, there has to have been some level of personal work that you have done to recognize, yeah, things need to be different and I need to be better and I need to be acting in some way. So there, that, that, there needs to be an awareness at some level there. Um, Kimberly Latrice Jones, she's an activist out of um, uh, New York in Atlanta, and she's a co-author of I'm Not Dying Tonight. Um, I'm Not Dying With You Tonight. Really good friend of mine, and she states over and over again on her platforms that I don't want an ally. 
I want an accomplice, right? She makes this really big difference between where an ally stands and where an accomplice stands. I think where we're having a difficult time as a society is really defining what allyship and accomplice mean. I think people have different definitions with different behavior tied to it, right? Mm -hmm. And so some may think that allyship is in action, is in solidarity versus where Kimberly you know, Jones breaks it down. But like an accomplice is someone I don't have to teach I don't have to break down. They understand, they get it, and they can point it out as I'm pointing it out. They are on my right hand, and we have formulated a strategic plan to dismantle white supremacy together. We know how to call out microaggressions. We could call out racism, whether it be on the job, whether it be in systems of education, whether it be in, in, in conversation with friends and family over dinner, right? She knows or he knows when I'm offended. He or she knows when I just dealt with a, a racist antic, and right? So she, she makes accomplice as if we are side by side. You are, you are the rib to, 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 my, to my rib, right? Versus allyship is this like coming up this coming up in age of like, I'm understanding, I'm agreeing, I'm learning, and I'm seeing, and I wanna take action, and I wanna be careful about what action I take, versus where accomplice has already said, I know what I'm willing to risk. I've made it very clear what I'm willing to do and what I'm not willing to do to get it done, and I'm willing to risk my job, and I'm willing to risk relationships, and I'm willing to put myself in an uncomfortable position to be your right hand, because I know with you being, and again, I'm only going to speak from my experience, with you being a Black woman in America, I know that you're constantly in a state of being uncomfortable, so I'm going to put myself in line, I'm be uncomfortable with you, right? So not saying that an allyship can't come and still be an accomplice as well but it's who you're talking to that's going to define how that's answered. Because if you view accomplice as doing the act, being, being at the front line, and at times speaking up before I do because I'm exhausted, because I'm exhausted with having to constantly tell the narrative over and over again. So you take the reins and you make sure that they know that this was, a, this was, this was racism in itself and you break it down to them, that's an accomplice. That's who I want because I'm on the front lines every day and I'm exhausted. So again, back to your question, can an ally, can someone learning allyship step into an accomplice? It really depends on who's defining allyship and who's defining accomplice. Mm -hmm. So I, I really, I appreciate that. And what I was, what I, what it, what it brought out in, in my thinking around the notion of, even if they don't know it, for them to step in when you're exhausted, to be able to, to still push that conversation forward within the movement, and then you know bring that into the same time that there's, they still might receive pushback or they still might get it wrong, that people still get stuck in the conundrum of the stuckness. So how, how can we work within this movement to still hold where we're still teaching, still asking people to learn, still calling people into the work, still calling them out when they're making those mistakes, and then asking them to step up on our behalf when we're exhausted? How do we, how do we hold all of that? I think people have to have real conversations with themselves. I think people really need to sit and say, what am I willing to lose for the movement? Because the reality is, someone asked me one time, Linda Sarsar, who's a, a, an activist nationally known, she had asked me if I was willing to die for the movement. And I said, no. She asked me why. I said, I have a son at home. I said, what do I look like putting my life on the line for other families and I don't get to go home to mine? And now he's left with this lifelong pain that his mother died fighting for black lives while I left him without a mother, a black son, right? So. I know when the riot gear come out, when the SWAT team come out, I go home. It's time for me to go home because I'm not, I'm not putting my life, I'm not losing my life. I need to get home to my child. That's the boundary and, and the honest conversation I had to have with myself as an activist in the movement. And I think more people need to have that conversations with themselves to kind of move from being unstuck because you're only stuck when you're really not sure in which direction you wanna move. If you know that I'm not gonna go left, then you're gonna move right. So I think being honest with yourself about what you're willing to sacrifice is going to be the first step to really deciding how you're going to move in this movement. 
Lisa. I think too, you know, if, if you let, I, I, what I try to encourage folks to do is replace the word ally with decent human being, right? Or allyship as basic human decency, right? So you can identify yourself as an ally and that's great, but that's like being at the most basic of just respecting people, right? So you can say that you're an ally all you want. And if you want to be more than just a decent human being, then you need to step up. Like Brisa is saying, there's got to be something else that you need to be doing other than the bare minimum. Allyship is basic, as it said just in the chat, is bare minimum. So if you, so for those of you who are touting yourselves as allies, think of it less as like, oh yeah, I support the people. It's like, nope, I'm just being a basic human being and I'm just being decent. And so let's, so hopefully that will motivate you to think about, okay, what else do I need to be doing? And let me move into these advocacy and accomplice roles. Um, Cause action's required and we need more than just basic like human decency right now to support and to get these movements going and or to keep them going. And a lot of head nods. Rachel. I think the first thing is to acknowledge the immense amount of privilege it is to be able to opt into allyship when black folks experience this every day, people with disabilities, trans folks live this, whether they like it or not. And so I think we, the other part we need to normalize is getting it wrong. Think about anything that we have learned in our entire lives. You don't step into your algebra class and know how to solve for X on the first day. And, and that's just how it is. That's what learning is. And you layer that with unlearning. We have centuries of history that was told to us incorrectly that we have to then unlearn. And that takes even more work. But we, have, we just have to do it. I, I, this idea of being stuck, that in itself is privilege. You have to push farther than that. Because you have to ask yourself why you feel stuck. Are you afraid of making a, a mistake? Are you afraid of being embarrassed or feeling ashamed? All of those emotions will pales in comparison to what marginalized and oppressed folks experience every single day. So I think the other part too with allyship, accomplice, all of that stuff is we, we cannot look to these folks to fix it or they cannot give us the answers. And I think specifically from a higher education perspective, a lot of what I've asked my colleagues about is what they, what they plan to do to support black students. And we can, we can do climate surveys to death. We can gather as much data points as we want from our black faculty, our black students, our black staff. But if we're not gonna do anything with that, they should not be the ones to solve these problems. This is not for them to fix. Mm. And I, I would like to add too, because I hear this, this talk around like identifying as an ally or identifying, right? Like I would caution people to never call themselves an ally. Um, and really like that's, that's, whether it's accomplice or advocate or allyship, it is something that maybe somebody that is experiencing oppression in the moment recognizes in you and it is more of an action and they might validate you. And even in validation, like I would say it is decency, right? It is decency to get to equity. And so I really don't enjoy even hearing the word thank you for doing something that just puts us here. So I would refrain from even identifying those labels. Those are labels that someone in a experience where they're not as privileged can recognize in you, but I wouldn't even use the words thank you. I would be really humble in my approach to that because what that enforces is an identity that then you sit in and you get comfortable. And these are terms that you need to be asking yourself in every action, in every moment, am I seeing everything? Am I acting with equity? Am I thinking about how these systems play out? And am I challenging myself and others to look a little bit further and a little bit deeper? Okay, I, and when I when I hear you talking about that, this notion of ally as an identity, you know, it really kind of creates this notion that the struggle is a currency of some kind, and that people can just, you know, exchange it and 
if it's if it's part of some sort of currency within the movement does it does it take away from the actual work that needs to get done so the work that needs to get done and this is this is probably i think more pronounced in the lgbtq plus communities where initially to get the work done especially on campuses uh, the word ally was used when you passed a certain amount of training courses and certifications and rainbow stick it, stickers were put up on office or cubicles to show that you did your training um, and that you were a safe space to come to. And the work there was to show that work was being done. And what it ended up doing was creating a little bit of peer pressure. People that didn't originally want to go to the trainings wanted to go to the trainings because they needed that rainbow sticker to show that they were a safe space. And so this becomes more of an ethical question around like, what are the means to get to those ends? And really at the end of the day, we're at a place now in our society where we can push a little bit harder where we can ask tougher questions and where we can really raise the levels. And we, I would encourage us to do that and not just to kind of put the sticker up, so to speak, but to really dig in about what change needs to happen. And if we're not uncomfortable in our daily lives and we have privilege in our different identities, then we're not challenging ourselves enough. So are you asking, so then you're asking folks to just sit in the discomfort, stay in the discomfort, but we also know that, as Rachel was talking about, there's a privilege that many still have where they can leave that discomfort in the office space and go home and live in their non-diverse neighborhood or go pick up their kids at a non-diverse school or, you know, share dinner with their non-diverse friends and family. So how do, you know, what does the other work look like that is more than just the badge or more than just the ally as identity? And I open that, you know, Matthew, I'm curious, what are your thoughts on that? I've been seeing your name being mentioned in the chat box too, as somebody who's really done a lot of work around allyship for yourself and your organization. Yeah. Um, I was thinking of regards to this as like three out of four white people in the U S uh, do not have a close person in their immediate friend group who's a person of color. And why is that? And I see this, this um, that that's a perpetuation of white supremacy, whether it's overt or covert um, in those spaces where people are stepping in and staying in that insulated zone and their privilege is built on the loss of someone else's privilege. And so it's, I think, continually stepping into that space uh, to both acknowledge your privilege and recognize where that comes from. Um, and look to become an accomplice in a lot of ways. I know we we're talking about like titles around that, um, but becoming an accomplice through stepping in, what, like why are you in these old white people only zones? Are you stepping into the work for racial equity, uh, especially in the United States to create a space where you're doing that work? And I think one of the things too, is that it's, this isn't an invitation um, to necessarily step into like black, brown or indigenous spaces where you can gain brownie points or lead or take over or explain these different things. And here I am even as like a cis white male answering these questions and, and what that is or being a part of this group today. Um, and I'm honored to be invited into this space. Um, yet my goal isn't to take over or, or lead these components or load myself up with the work or load it up on somebody else because the adaptive work needs to happen from all of us and we need to keep loading it up in these different areas that need this, um, this growth. And so, I think one of the things that we can do is step into that space as white people where we're talking about that, where we're um, advocating alongside uh, people of color, where if you're in your own space, you're just gonna make a choice as an ally where you're thinking, oh, this is what people need. But if you don't step into those areas, live life with people, have friends who are people of color, how are you gonna know what that looks like? How are our key decision makers who are mostly white there's an underrepresentation in our decision makers here in San Diego, in the United States. What are we going to do to break down those barriers? And I think it's key that we have connections and that work isn't loaded up on a certain people group to perpetuate those messages and for white people to step into the work to disrupt the covert and overt uh, white supremacy that they see around them, myself included, whether that's conversations. I live here in City Heights and there's a, a pretty big mixture in City Heights of, of people groups. But I, I hear white people all the time talk about, oh, City Heights is really up and coming. 
but really what they're saying is there's more white people moving in. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I see people say that all the time and I need to speak out about that too. I haven't spoken out about that, but it's something that has weighed upon me. So it's like, what can I do to continue in that work? I'm not excluded from it. Um, I need to load myself up with that work at the same time as I need to continue to uh, load other people up and encourage them to do the work too. And something I have noticed several times now in the chat is this question about non-Black people also being anti-Black racists or um, working against anti-Blackness. And I think that's something that comes up in my work too, is that LGBTQ people, especially those who are white, will often say, oh, we're the same, the struggles are the same, and therefore I can't be racist. I think some of the most awful things I've ever heard in my life um, in terms of problematic stuff have, has come from cis, gay, white males. And I'm not saying that that's true for all of them, but there is something about like, well, I'm oppressed and not only, it, is that sort of like a thing um and i should get brownie points for that but therefore i can't be racist or i can't be sexist and even if i am it's okay because i experience oppression too um and i think that's something that i you know and that's why a lot of lgbtq plus spaces tend to be dominated by cis gay white men um and what does that mean? And so even in my own work, how can I help people who are processing their own oppression around a certain identity also recognize, yeah, you also need to be doing some work around anti -race, being anti-racist, right? Or to be less ableist in the way that we are facilitating groups or spaces, especially during a pandemic when there is not, when access looks even different for folks, the fact that we are using Zoom so often for people who, without captions, right? So there's just all of this stuff that comes up. Um, and so I just wanted to speak to that, that absolutely there are groups that are oppressed that are actively contributing to the oppression of other groups. And we need to be able to do that work and recognize that, you know, as for my family, right? Coming from a Mexican background, there was a lot of anti-Blackness in that in those spaces that I didn't recognize until later. But that also is separate, but connected to maybe some bias and prejudice around being Mexican, right? We have kids that are locked in cages currently. That's also happening. That has been happening, right? And so um, they're all connected and they're different and we need to, the work um, as been said has been, needs to be, look, needs to look different for different folks. And I think what Nick is offering, oh, sorry, go ahead, Rachel. Um, I think the question about being a non-Black person of color, that definitely resonates with me as I'm seeing um, what my friends have called like the white privilege syllabi of things you could read and all the different infographics and, and things like that, that that are directed toward white people. I'm also very careful to include and non-Black people of color because we are very much included in that audience. And as someone that is monoracially Filipino, we have a lot of anti-Blackness in our culture and we're not going to fix that unless we acknowledge that it exists. And so part of what I've been seeing is, is going back into the history of Black and Filipino solidarity. And what I want folks to be careful about is that it's important to acknowledge that that history exists as a form of solidarity, but the conclusive statement cannot be that the Black community has shown up for us, therefore we must show up for them, because this is not a transactional exchange. The Filipino community should show up for the Black community because it's important, because that's what decent human beings do, and not because they did this, so must we then in exchange. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Crystal, I think you were gonna. No, I was just gonna echo um, Rachel and Nick covered it in terms of there was a question around like this honorary whiteness for the API and Latinx communities. And this is it right here. It is, you know, we really need to hold our intersectionality and recognize that just because we may um, be underrepresented in one of our identities does not necessarily mean that we hold anti-racist mentality being in all of our actions moving forward. And so it really invites that. So thank you both for it. This chat, I don't know if all of you are looking at this chat, but I think you should take a moment because it is blowing up. There's a lot of praise for each of you. Um, a lot of questions that before I can even get to it, slip through because there's 12 more messages. Uh, 
somebody was talking, you know, and Nick, you, you kind of touched on it. And I think Rachel, you did as well, this notion of the oppression Olympics and the call to action for other groups or other communities to come forward and be in support when the Black Lives Matter movement needs it, um, when all movements need it. And one of the things that I've seen even in that and, uh, you know, some conflict around it is a lot of the signs that get put up are, you know, Filipinos for Black Lives or Latinx for Black Lives and whether or not that is centering self before the movement that they're trying to support. So I'm curious, Brisa, Brisa what your thoughts are on that and what can support look like? What are people getting wrong? What can, what can we all do better in this movement as we live and breathe some of our experiences daily? What needs to change? Yeah. I think building authentic relationships with people across the table is extremely important and extremely vital. I think even myself, there was a lot of movements around me growing up that I didn't understand. And in, I was blessed with the opportunity to sit down with people from those communities and really hear their stories, really hear their experiences from, from multiple perspectives, and then get involved and, and be silent and 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 really just be a sponge in those spaces. And then in, in addition to building those relationships, being able to then be challenged by them because the relationship was authentic, because the relationship was established where we could challenge, where we could critique, where they could say, you know, this is where you could do better. This is where you could stand up. And really using the platforms that you already have. Sometimes it's as simple as knowing that I have access to this door? How do I hold it open so that you can walk through as well? How do I make sure that my platform gives your story a voice? Um, just as simple as really just, again, building that relationship. What would you do for your best friend to make sure she was successful? And taking that same perspective and applying it to the communities that you may not understand um, and reaching across the table every single time and realizing too that a rising tide truly lifts all boats. I know that in helping these communities, it helps my community as well. And really understanding that and embedding that into your core so that you move differently at all times. Mm -hmm. A beautiful call to action, beautiful call to action around building relationships. And so I ask each of you, what is what else can we build upon that as a call to action for our, our audience? Crystal? So I, I think that um, first I would say like, take a look at all of your LinkedIn's. Who are you following? And do you know who are the black voices that are leading in different industries, your industries? Um, so there's one very tangible one. Um, if you are about to hire a vendor or do business, like who are you working with? And are you aware of who that business is owned by and what they represent and what their values or ideals are? It's small actions too, um, even just in the LGBTQ plus area, like we've had a wonderful um, movement in terms of like, I'll go with you, right? So taking transgender people to the bathroom is an act of being an accomplice. That's being an accomplice. I physically am going to take you and I know that people are going to, might be angry or violent as we go to the bathroom and my body will physically protect you, right? Taking the action, putting yourself out there and really using your power and privilege to make this a more inclusive and equitable world. Thank you, thank you. Rachel? I think it's, for me, it's always important to call upon the aggregate impact of small acts that this took centuries to create. And we ha there's an acceptance around not seeing the world that we want in our lifetimes and making peace with that. And, and it's not, I've heard that it's not a marathon, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. And I've heard the additional offering of it's not a marathon, it's a relay race. And that resonates a lot more with me, you know? So when the baton is in your hands for your lifetime, what are you gonna do with that? What responsibility do you bear around being in this generation? Um, and sometimes that means, um, you know, if someone gets interrupted in a meeting that you circle back and say, hey, did you have something to say? Mm -hmm. Or 
not waiting until the meeting is over to agree with me behind closed doors, but speaking up while the meeting is happening. I've been through that too many times. Um, and I think it's, it's, this is for life. So you have to just be in a constant state of thinking, reflecting, learning, like Brisa was saying, this, you have to find ways to sustain yourself through this lifetime of doing this work. Um, because it doesn't end and there's always going to be new things we discover um, and things that we have to change and things we get wrong and have to course correct and do right. Um, but we can't ignore the impact of all the little things that we do, the businesses we support, um, the conversations we have with people, all of that matters and all of it counts. Mm, thank you. I saw a lot of head nods in, in, in agreement with you on speaking up. Thank you. Matthew? I think one of the things right now, especially for white people, is kind of this like rally behind a shared enemy, right? So it's like there's Trump is in the White House and that's uh, angered a lot of people with the overt racism that he's demonstrated. Uh, and people are in this, this rally to November, but the work isn't gonna end in November. If we get someone else in office, that work uh, for the systemic racism doesn't end with one person. Truly he's uh, like an overt racist is in, in this position, but somebody else is gonna step in uh, and we need to continue the work, both uh, to, to rally behind uh, what's happening, to end the injustices that are here, and continue to step into those spaces. We can't just load it up and say, okay, now somebody's there who's going to take care of it. We need to continue on in that journey of uh, calling it out, of speaking it, of saying, saying the names, and stepping into spaces where we can support uh, people of color in this, this journey um, and in, in the oppression that they're facing their day to day. Absolutely. I'm in complete agreement. I think to add to that too, it's not just about the November race. It's also what we're noticing here in our local communities. So pay attention to our own politics mm -hmm. in our own districts and what it is that they're voting for, how we can support them and take a deeper dive into the learning so that we know. Thank you, Matthew. Nick? Yeah, so um a couple things came to mind. I think local politics is just as important as national politics. If you don't know who your city council members are, and if you don't know who your mayor is, you're not trying hard enough. Um, those are the people who are directly impacting your local community. Those positions are sometimes just as, if not more important than the folks who are doing uh, are on the national scale, right? Or who are doing state at the, work at the state level. So if you're not voting in local politics, then you need to try a hell of a lot harder. Um, and there's this notion about, the, about being at the table and some, something that was pointed out to me was, there's this notion about, oh, we need to bring more people to the table. And I'm like, but who is in control of this table, <laughs> right? So I think asking yourself, and I'm like, oh, I would never, I didn't think about it that way. And so those are the sorts of things that, to really question, like, why are we doing what we're doing? And how is that, where did that come from, right? How, that's the history of it tends to be really important. And the last thing I'll say while I'm on the mic is that um, Pride Month ended, um, but of course we know that there we should, Pride Month, every month is Pride Month for me, especially. Um, and that black, a black trans woman and a Latinx trans woman were the leaders of the Pride movement. And so that's why it's so unfortunate and infuriating to me when white LGBTQ folks aren't in it for black lives. I'm like, this, the reason why we have pride is to celebrate when a black trans woman started a riot, mm -hmm. right? And um, so that's the last thing that I'll, that I'll mention onto the mic. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you all so very much before Tony speaks. I just, I just wanna honor each of you for creating such a rich dialogue. I don't think I've ever seen the chat box go off this much. Uh, you've offered a tremendous amount of learning for myself, I hope for all of you, as well as our audience. Thank you so very much. Tony? Doc, Dr. Kamani, um, I'll just say from looking from the outside and watching this, uh, the intersectionality was amazing. Um, it brought a richness to the discussion and the depth of the discussion was, was really phenomenal. And, it had a lot to do with not only your, um, you moderating this, Dr. Kamani, but the amazing people that we have in front of us. I'll have to tell you, I'm, I'm tired. I'm tired 
because this is really, really difficult work. It's exhausting work. And to have folks like you and, and many of the positions that you are in, I'm very thankful because it's, it's, uh, it's exhausting work. And, and someone, uh, someone from the outside watching this who wanted to learn and see, I think they learned a lot, but they also understood how much work is needed. And, and so I want to say thank you to all of you. Uh, very proud to have you, at least for today, as a part of our, our RISE Familia. And hopefully as we move forward, we will be able to hear from you guys again, because trust me, uh, the chat box was on fire today. I mean, there are so many, well over a couple of hundred comments, if not more. So thank you all. And, and please, if there's anything we can do to support your work, let RISE know and we'll do whatever we can to be supportive. Um, with that, I uh, wanna let you all know about a few upcoming programs um, when it comes to the RISE, RISE organization. As you all know, we focus on leadership. Uh, we focus on civic engagement, which you saw today, and also support of, of nonprofits and small businesses. Uh, we will continue to have our small business trainings. Just get on our, our, our RISE uh, website. You'll see the trainings that we have. They're really great. Uh, the next RISE Now event next week is going to be about COVID-19. And the question is, is it over or not? And we know it's not. And, and if you want to see the previous RISE Now webinars, uh, you can get to the site that we are we were citing right there on the screen. So with that, Dr. Kamani, I appreciate you. My you pleasure. And before we leave, uh, we have a poll question. And, and please answer this because it helps us understand if we're doing okay or if we're not. Uh, it says overall, how would you rate the virtual event? And uh, it's gonna pop up on the screen. You let us know how we did and then we'll try to get better for you. Thank you all for the insight and we appreciate it. God bless you. And have a wonderful, wonderful uh, evening and weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Y'all are amazing. Thank you so much for taking the time today to be a part of this. Tr truly, truly. Bye for now. <laughs>